Would join me in turning back to 1 Timothy chapter number 6, if you would. In these weeks, we are giving our attention to the subject of contentment, seeking to understand what the Lord has for us in this, particularly grasp uh, my attention in reading through this passage that verse number six, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I thought, what is Paul saying and what does that mean? Uh, how does that fit with the other things that were taught in the New Testament? So this is an admonition regarding contentment and a warning against the love of material things. And you watch the passage unfold. Uh, to love the material is also a challenge that uh, Paul not only issues in this first letter, but he also uh, issues it again in the second letter. If you'll remember the perilous times, the perilous times he defines as times that are marked uh, by covetousness, lovers of them own, their own selves and covetousness that could be translated lovers of money. <laughs> Lovers of their own selves, lovers of money. But then it talks about later uh, being uh, lovers of things or lovers of pleasure. And so Paul has this on his heart as he writes these letters to Timothy. You know, Timothy's task was a ministry there at Ephesus. Whether it was one church or multiple churches, uh, we don't know. But we know that uh, Timothy's responsibility was to stay there and to minister to those churches or that church. And so they had the letter of Ephesians uh, in hand. But when he writes to Timothy, he hones in very specifically on some things that Timothy uh, needs to make sure get across to these people. Admonitions and warnings. Uh, Tozer writes under the heading of the blessedness of possessing nothing. That title itself grasped my attention. The blessedness of possessing nothing. Would you listen as I read a couple of paragraphs from Tozer? Because I really believe uh, this establishes in our minds of what has gone awry. It's not really stuff outside of us that's the problem. It's sin inside of us that's the problem. Uh, lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, lovers of money, uh, those kind of things. Uh, so Tozer strikes this with these words, the blessedness of possessing nothing. He writes, and I quote, Before the Lord God made man upon the earth... He first prepared for him a world of useful and pleasant things for his sustenance and delight. In the creation account, these are simply things. They were made for man's use, but they were meant to be external to the man and subservient to him. In the deep heart of the man was a shrine where none but God was worthy to come. Within him was God. Without, outside of him, a thousand gifts which God had showered upon him. But sin has introduced complications and has made those very gifts of God a potential source of ruin to the soul. Our woes began when God was forced out of his central shrine and things were allowed to enter. Within the human heart, things have taken over. Men have now by nature no peace within their hearts, for God is crowned there no longer. But there is a moral dusk. Stubborn and aggressive usurpers fight among themselves for first place on the throne. Well, this is not a mere metaphor, he writes, but an accurate analysis of our real spiritual trouble. There is within, within the human heart a tough, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns my and mine look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. They express the real nature of the old Adamic man better than a thousand volumes of theology could do. They are verbal symptoms of our deep disease. The roots of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one rootlet lest we die. Things have become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. 
God's gifts now take the place of God. And the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous substitution. Our Lord referred to this tyranny of things when he said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. So I think fundamentally a statement about discipleship would be that discipleship is death to self and discipleship is death to stuff. It really is. It's death to self and it's death to stuff. The throne of our heart must always be occupied by God himself. The throne of our heart must always be occupied by God himself. Otherwise, what are we guilty of? Idolatry. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. The throne of our heart must always be occupied by God himself. Otherwise, we are guilty of idolatry. We studied the book of Colossians, finished it up several weeks ago. We came to this portion with these imperatives for us in Colossians chapter 3. But I want to point out tonight a connection. He said, if ye, the, if ye then be risen with Christ, or since you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. There's the first imperative. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand, on the right hand of God. The second imperative, you'll remember, is set your affection on things above. And the negative, not on things on the earth. The reason, verse 3, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That is our destiny. That is where we're headed. So the third imperative now comes in verse number five, mortify therefore your members, which are, notice this phrase, upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. Where's all this happening in our hearts? Evil concupiscence or lust and covetousness, next phrase, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. And the fourth imperative, verse number eight. But now ye also put off all of these. Anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. He says in the end of verse number five, when he's talking about these things, he speaks of covetousness, which is a heart issue, which is idolatry. So again, the throne of our heart must always be occupied by God himself. Otherwise, we are guilty of idolatry. So we have covetousness, which is idolatry. <laughs> And we have contentment, godliness with contentment in our text in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and take a few more minutes this evening thinking this out under the title of the surrender, the surrender of contentment. You're hearing words like mortify and death for the covetous material things are longed for. They're sought after. But for the one who is content, material things are gifts to be stewarded. None of it's ours. None of it's ours. For the covetous man, material things are longed for and sought after. But for the content man, material things are simply gifts to be stewarded. And covetousness has to do with earthly status. So for the covetous man, he's concerned with earthly status. In regards to the man of contentment, he accepts and serves in the place where God has put him. 
Life situations for the covetous are rejected. They're fixed. They're agitating. We heard about those false teachers in our text last week. For the contented one, life situations are embraced with expectancy. So when Jesus speaks of denial of self and death to self, he's talking about yielding our lives up to the Lord. The surrender of contentment. The first two verses of 1 Timothy 6 let, all, uh, let as many servants or slaves as are under the yoke, it's a vivid picture of slavery, under the yoke, count their own masters worthy of all honor. Reason that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. So if someone says, no, as a believing slave, I'm not going to do this, well, the name of God and his doctrine are blasphemed they're despised another group would be those that have believing masters in verse number two they that have believing masters let them not despise them don't think down on them that's what the word despise means because they are brethren but rather do them service turn it back around the other way you're there to serve because they are faithful and beloved they're brothers in christ they're partakers of the benefit and then he says to the young Timothy, these things you need to teach and you need to exhort. Now, I think it'd be helpful to us to turn back a few pages to Ephesians chapter 6. I, I know that when we study these things in the context of book studies, which we've done over the years, uh, they fall in line. They come in line with other things that have been taught. And they're part of... An emphasis that's developed there. But I think sometimes because it's part of that, we might overlook the fact that this fits right with the other testimonies regarding subjection or submission. Now, we're to be submitting ourselves one to another. If you turn back to chapter 5 of Ephesians, you see in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And so when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, chapter 5, verse 18... We'll be worshiping people who are speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. We will be, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we will be submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now that lays a foundation. That's basically the root truth. And now what's going to grow out of that is these relationships that we find ourselves in. In specific, the relationships that people in that day, in that society, in that culture found themselves in. There's a relationship of a wife to her husband, a relationship of submission unto him. The husband is to submit by loving his wife as Christ loves the church. It goes right down and comes into chapter number six. It talks about submission of children to their parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That's been established uh, since the Old Testament. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, fathers, in regards to your children, don't provoke them to wrath. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And then it flows right into another relationship that was in the midst of that culture, and that would be of slaves. Servants, the way it's translated in the King James, servants... Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. What's it to look like with fear and trembling? In singleness of heart. Notice the last phrase, because this is crucial, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but again, as the servants of Christ. And again, doing the will of God from the heart. Again, verse 7, with goodwill, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And then it goes on to speak to the masters in regards to those slaves. Did you notice how much of that text is taken up with a slave's responsibility to his master? And notice Paul is repetitious in what he's saying because he probably anticipates what you and I naturally feel. And it's like, ah, oh, that's unnatural. Are you kidding? 
an unbelieving master and I'm a believing slave and I'm supposed to be doing this? And Paul says, yes, from the heart, not with eye service so you won't get in trouble with him, but with an eye on the Lord. And he says it repeatedly and he goes back and circles back to it again because he knows it will be hard for us to get that because it is much easier to submit in a scenario when the person you're submitting to loves and serves the Lord. It can be a very blessed place to be. But still our human nature is a bit rigid about that. Can I just stop and say, if, if we won't do this, we just won't obey God. Now you as a young person, you refuse to honor and obey your parents. You're refusing to do what God mandates that you do and why Christ saved you so that you can do that as unto the Lord. In a slave and master situation, it's, 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 it's striking because you're thinking there, there must be something here that I'm missing. Actually, no, there's nothing missing. This is doing the will of God from the heart. This is slaves of Christ. This is as to the Lord and not, to, what are you saying, pastor? I'm saying it's a spiritual issue. Plain and simple. It's a spiritual issue. If I won't do it, I simply won't do it. I don't love Christ enough to do it. I don't love God enough to do it. And while I won't say it out loud, I'm saying every day, I am not about to do what God told me to do. Now, if you're a child of God, expect a spanking because it's coming. And the worst spanking that could come is for God to just let you go on your present path. Because you can't slave for sin and not end up a slave of sin. You can't yield your members an instrument of unrighteousness and not keep on doing unrighteousness. You yield your Instruments as instruments of righteousness because you're a believer and you keep on doing what? Righteousness. And guess what happens? That's Christian character. That's integrity. That's how we become the people that God saved us to be. That's how we be Christ people. That's how we are Christian. We're Christ folk. So in a scenario where there's 60 million slaves, you have a number of those slaves evidently that have come to Christ. And so Paul writing to the Ephesians tells them now, now this is the way slaves that are Christians are to behave and how they're to live. And you know what? Because of Christ in you and because of the filling of God's Holy Spirit, you can do that. None of this is ever dis disconnected from Christ. None of this is ever I'm going to grit. I'm going to make up my mind. I'm going to do this. No, all of this hinges on you having the spirit of God in you. Now, Colossians, chapter number three, we have a very similar. I love the way these texts lay side by side. And you and I have seen them together over the years. Because in chapter three and verse 16, where we've seen the spirit of Christ in us, the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, verse 16 of chapter three the, net, the parallel phrase is, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Okay? So when the spirit of Christ is filling you and the spirit of Christ is having his way with you, you will know that because the word of Christ will be dwelling richly in you. And again, doing the same thing, it'll teach you and admonish. you teaching and admonishing one another. Psalms, it, it leads to worship, doesn't it? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And then what does it do? It goes right back to how we're living our lives. You are not a worshiper of God. If you come to this place and you sing hymns and you act like you are walking with God and you reject what God says in the next paragraph. See, there's private worship, which is day to day walking worthy and there's public gatherings where the word of Christ dwells in us and we teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns verse number 18 wives verse 19 husbands verse 20 children verse 21 fathers verse 22 servants so they've already received this instruction servants obey in all things all things your masters 
according to the flesh. Those that are your masters in this life, similar terminology, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, wholeheartedly fearing God. This is how you reverence God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, as something done for the Lord and not unto men. Very much like Ephesians, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. God has taught over and over in the scripture sowing and reaping. There's always some rebel that thinks they're the exception. I'm going to sow and I'm not going to reap. God said, what you sow, you're going to reap. Nobody sows without reaping what they sowed. Okay? And you say, Pastor, you're, you're talking like on an elementary level tonight. Yes, I am, because for some reason, this is not getting through. <laughs> for some reason, some of us don't get this. And we don't understand that we have hearts that are rebelling against God. And we have hearts that are rebelling against his word. Another reason that we have to park and stop and say, let's, let's do this in an ABC manner is because we're American Christians. And we think we have some kind of right for nobody to own us or tell us what to do. We got a problem. God allowed many Christians to be owned. To be owned. And then he told them, this is how I want you to live as Christian slaves, because you're mine and because you're here on my mission. You need to occupy the role in life that God has ordered for you. But what if it's unfair? What if it's abusive? What if it's an, an unbelieving master? What if it's hard? What if it's unrewarding? Well, the teaching is still the same. That is a test that is severe at times, but the admonition doesn't change. Let as many servants, slaves as are under the yoke, count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. That's 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 1. So first of all tonight, Contentment is a vital issue. It really is. It's a vital issue for every believer. It's a vital issue for me. It's a vital issue for you. Contentment is a vital issue for every believer. It's part of the faith life. The Bible tells us to rejoice. The Bible tells us to submit. The Bible gives us direction in regards to contentment. It's part of the faith life. To believe that God chose this place for me. It's part of the faith life to believe that God chose this place for me. And it is one of our Christian obligations to live our lives content with God's choices. We believe in the providence of God. We believe the Bible teaches that. We believe he overrules things. We're watching him do that with Abraham, aren't we? We also believe he orchestrates things. Think of God as the great conductor. <laughs> he orchestrates it all. It's part of the faith life to believe that God chose this place for me. And it is one of our Christian obligations to live our lives content with God's choices. Maybe we think if I could change this, I would. I changed my place in life, people, location, vocation. I changed health challenges. I changed my financial status. I would alter my circumstances. Turn it around. God could change it. And he hasn't. We're talking about contentment. We're talking about settling in the fact that God... And knows what he's doing. Contentment is a vital issue for every believer. I surrender all for us is a daily practice. I'm not suggesting tonight 
that you sing that song once, you say that one time, and it's over. No, it is a daily practice. I surrender all. Yielded, Lord, to thee, another hymn in our hymn book. That's a lifestyle. I surrender all is a daily practice. Yielded, Lord, to thee is a lifestyle. And have thine own way, Lord, is really a moment-by-moment -moment attitude, isn't it? All kinds of adjustments have to be made throughout the days. Have thine own way, Lord, even in this. Wasn't expecting this. Wasn't ready for this. But, Lord, you have your way. The worthiness is the Lord's, isn't it? The worthiness of verse number one is the Lord's. So the rebellion is against the Lord. We as believers occupy the highest possible place as children of God. Because of that, we are ready and willing to occupy the lowest possible place in this life for Christ's glory. The believer occupies the highest possible place as a child of God. Thus, the believer is ready and willing to occupy the lowest possible place in this life for Christ's glory. Contentment is a vital issue for every believer. Reactions to our lot in life. There's your second line there. Reactions to our lot in life depreciates the Lord's character. It depreciates our Lord's character. Verse number one tells us, instructs us to do this, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. To blaspheme basically means to disrespect. To disrespect. To speak, profan prof to speak profanely of sacred things. It's really one of the strongest words that denotes derision and abuse of speech and ridicule. Most often it's used as that which is done against God. So to fail to do this, to react and to resist is to disrespect God. To disrespect the name of God, it says in verse number one, which is basically everything that makes up who he is, his entire revelation of himself. But also to disrespect his doctrine, to disrespect what his word teaches. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. It disrespects the name of God. It disrespects his doctrine. So those rebelling against God's choices for their lives are really blaspheming God. And everything that he teaches. They're disrespecting and dishonoring his person. And as Tozer points out, this rebellion is sourced in the human heart. In the fallen heart. This disrespect is reflective of Satan's uprising. In heaven. In eternity past. Reactions to our lot in life depreciate the Lord's character. Secondly, resignation to God's right to rule is to be evident in every situation. Now we can very quickly reason around this. We can get so proficient at outthinking even God's word that we don't stop to recognize resigning ourselves to God's right to rule is to be evident in every situation. The respect and the honor is given to God. The despot and the blasphemy is against God. And I would suggest to you this word from God rifles through all of our arguments. It rifles through all of our excuses. It fits into every single part of life. Folks, Christians behave in untoward ways in various situations and begin to brag about what they told that police officer. What they told that guy at the hospital, what they told this person or that person it just makes you cringe. It makes you just want to crawl under the table and say, would you please quit claiming to know Christ? You are blaspheming in the name of Christ. If we get a hold of the fact that our disrespect and dishonor for those that God has put over us is a rejecting of God himself, then it becomes evident that is a spiritual issue that has to be dealt with. There's no interest in that. 
There's a spiritual life issue that has to be dealt with. Because there's no interest in serving God. He saved you to what? To worship and serve him. He redeemed you to worship and serve him. And no interest in that is something we have to investigate in regards to have I indeed be, been born again. This rifles through all of our arguments. It rifles through all of our excuses. And the rejection of this is a rejection of God himself. This is a hard issue. It's something that I have to address at the heart level. It's something you have to address at the heart level, at the individual level. This is a life issue, isn't it? It moves with us throughout life. It's something that has to be addressed. And that one text that says, dads, dads, bring your children up and nurture and admonition of the Lord. Because otherwise you'll provoke them. You let them bring themselves up. You keep moving things around. You be inconsistent as a dad and you provoke your children. You be Christ-like. You be God-centered. You bring them up. You nurture them and admonish them. You establish for them the reality of how someone submits to the Lord, how someone subjects themselves to the Lord. Teach them that in your home and they will carry that throughout their life. And some of us were privileged to be Brought up in a generation of some good Christian men, faithful pastors who understood that. And people can throw all kinds of rocks at that. And talk about militancy and this, that, and the other. But I tell you what, I don't, I can't express more gratefulness. I can't rightly express how grateful I am for my dad. Because his admonition was, Mike, you can push the fence, the fence will never move. You can push the fence, but the fence will never move. Nurture, here's the fence. Admonition, it will not move. You will not talk back to me. You will not talk back to your mother. You will not talk back to the Christian school teacher. You will not talk back to the coach. You will not talk back to the police officer. You will not talk back to anybody that is over you, Mike, because you are to subject yourself to them as unto the Lord. Is that biblical? Is that right? Was he good to say that to me? You say, well, I got all it. You know, cultural psychology floating around my brain. I'm not quite sure about that. How can we not be quite sure about the Bible? Well, that sounds awful negative to me. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the godly. Standeth not in the way of sinners. Right? Sit, sitteth not in the what? Seat of the scornful. The word of God, folks, if we really believe it and if we really read it, brings before us the reality that contentment, this surrender of contentment, contentment is a vital issue for every believer. It must be addressed at the individual level and it requires a lifetime of adjustments along the way. This is how we honor our God. This is how we honor our God rather than blaspheming him. And we do the very opposite when we dishonor and despise those that we are to rank under. Well, Paul tells Timothy, evidently, Paul is thinking this is not going to be easy for Timothy because I'm not sure the people are going to rightly respond to this. So when he gets down to the verse number two, he gets to the end and he says this, these things teach and exhort. You could translate these things, keep teaching and keep urging. These things keep teaching and keep urging. This is, this alone is the norm for Christ's people. This is the opposite of what is natural. I know that, you know that. But this is the seizing of every opportunity to live out Christ. The seizing of every opportunity to live out Christ. Secondly, dismissal of this fundamental truth is false teaching. The 
dismissal of this fundamental truth is false teaching. After he says, these things, Timothy, keep teaching. These things, Timothy, keep urging. He turns in verse number three and says, if any man teaches otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine, which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and stripes of words, argument, debate, right? Whereof cometh what? What's at the heart of all this? Envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings. Verse 5, perverse disputings of men of, of corrupt minds. They're not only corrupt minds, but they're minds that are destitute of the truth. And what is the problem? What is the fundamental problem? They are supposing that gain is godliness. The idea there, they are supposing that they will benefit and gain from their claims, from their godliness. And this is godliness used in a, in a negative form. It's turned back the other way in verse number six, but godliness with contentment is great gain. See, they're supposing that gain is godliness. They're going to benefit materially from their religious activities or their religious teaching or whatever it might be. But he turns it back around and says, no, actually godliness with contentment is great gain. Dismissal of this fundamental truth is false teaching. First of all, our Lord Jesus Christ both lived and taught this. So you cannot be like Christ and throw off those that God has put over you. You cannot reflect Jesus Christ and retaliate against the circumstance you find yourself in. He was subject to his father's will completely and fully. He taught this contentment as the disciples way of life. He said, lay down your life. He says, lose your life. He says, follow me. He lived a life of resting completely in his father's care. So Paul says to Timothy, other teachings or teachers, everything that disagrees with this is a, a wrong, wrangling spirit, verse 4. It comes from a self-serving motive, a false godliness that believes that godliness is a means for material gain. He is, says it's proud, it's argumentative, it's envious. It's really a sick interest in disputing. There's no dispute in argument like trying to dispute with someone who throws off God's worthy rule over their life. It's in constant disagreement. It's deprived of the truth. Always questioning, always debating, always dismissing the truth. Paul says, a spiritual sickness. A spiritual sickness. And thank God when we call it what God calls it, there's hope. Because God offers spiritual cleansing and healing. And the answer in verse number six is really not arguing us into something. It's rather stating a beatitude of blessing when it says, but godliness, here it is, with contentment is great gain. It's mega gain. It's healthy. It's Christ teaching. It's scripture's teaching. It's sound. It's a great word that's used in first and second Timothy and Titus it's sound teaching our Lord Jesus Christ both lived this and taught this secondly the scriptures affirm they affirm the supreme value of Christ like sufficiency I told you last week the word contentment in the stoic mind was a self-sufficiency in this case it's a sufficiency that comes from Christ so the path to contentment is thinking and living as Christ thought and lived. This alone is sound and healthy and wholesome teaching. This is true godliness and content. Why does Paul have to say this? Because there are going to be plenty of people to teach you something else. Right? You know, plenty of people are going to teach you something else. But thirdly, this evening, spiritual wholeness and joyous acceptance is true wealth. You want to be truly wealthy. 
spiritual wholeness and joyous acceptance is true wealth. Resting wholly in the providential care. Resting wholly in God's providential care is distinctively Christian, isn't it? But godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world. It is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. He turns it now negative like he has done in earlier passages. He said, but, you want to talk about the other side of things, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lust. And those things drown men in destruction and perdition. Here's the principle for the love of money is the root of all evil. It's at the root of all kinds of evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Spiritual wholeness and joyous acceptance is true wealth. This life, first of all, this life is entered into and exited without any material things, isn't it? This life is entered into and exited without any material things. The writer says, having arrived naked because we are going to leave that way and cannot possibly leave any other way. Having arrived naked because we are going to leave that way and cannot possibly leave any other way. The few things we really need for our short stay are not going to disturb our minds as godly people. We are simply going to be content. This is our source of spiritual gain. I thought, well, he put that together. He took those truths and put that together. Having arrived naked because we're going to leave that way and cannot possibly leave any other way, the few things we really need for our short stay are not going to disturb our minds as godly people. We are simply going to be content. This is our source of spiritual gain. This life is entered into and exited without any material things. And secondly, the love of money fuels. It fuels carnality and vain pursuits. Take up the book of Ecclesiastes and watch as the wise man tells us that he lived this out practically. The love of money is the opposite of godliness with contentment. Those who intend to be rich will keep falling into temptations and snares. Be submitted to many thoughtless and hurtful lust, such as sink men into destruction or perdition. They'll be snared. They'll be trapped. As they're snatching at the tempting bait, they're caught in the snare. They're held by their lust. They promise a satisfaction that they can never give. They actually lead into the trap of harmful lust, luxury, indulgence, pride in clothing and possessions equals moral decay and spiritual decline and soul shipwreck. Luxury, indulgence, pride in clothing and material things leads to moral decay, spiritual decline, and ultimately, Paul says, soul shipwreck. Let's pray together. Father, contentment. While it seems at first gaze to become a rather small subject matter, ends up being intertwined with so many other matters, matters of envy, matters of complaining, matters of longing after something other than what you've given to us, matters of throwing off those that are over us, matters, Father, that Reveal the willfulness that is so much a part of our fallenness. 
And you have taught us here, we have seen in Ephesians and Colossians, Father, that this is not how Christians live. And those that are worshiping you in spirit and in truth cannot live this way. They must walk a worthy walk. Father, it sounds like a voice in the wilderness for me to stand and say these things in this culture in this day. And Father, even possibly among professing Christians who somehow have outreasoned your word and believe that somehow they are supported by you in their unwillingness to bow a knee to you and to surrender to you and to yield to you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work in my heart and the hearts of these dear people. And I pray that we would understand that you have nothing but good for us. Your saving work was not just to grant us spiritual life, the promise of heaven, but your salvation was to keep us from a life of vanity. Your life was to privilege us. Your provision was to privilege us with being part of your mission, advancing Christ, advancing the gospel, living out this truth. And Father, nobody here has always passed the test. All of us have faltered in our faith from time to time. But I pray that you, through your spirit, would help us to see how the Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself and took on the form of a man and laid down his life, gave up everything, emptied himself of what was rightfully his in order to bring us to you through his redemptive work. How tragic it is, Father, that we would accept that positionally, but reject that practically for ourselves. How convicting this has been for me. How piercing to look at how many times I have been discontented with you. And maybe that's come out in discontentment toward other people. But, Father, at the end of the day, you made it very clear. It is you that I am resisting. It is you that we resist. I pray for these dear folk in this culture, Father, that's always screaming for more. Advance yourself. Push yourself forward. Find satisfaction in material things. Thank you for such a profound Quotation from Tozer that just helps us see all the way back in Genesis 3 what happened. That there's a shrine, there's a holy place, there's a place in our heart, a throne that only you are worthy to sit on. Help us to see that when material things take your place, when created things take your place, we're in that Romans 1 trap. When we take your place, we are idolaters. I pray, Father, that we would do business with you so that we might live reverently before you. We'd stop pushing back at each other with disputes and arguments, fightings. We'd just settle in to the rest that comes by being yoked with Jesus Christ. Thank you that you provided for this because this will take a supernatural work in each of our hearts. May we be willing and ready to be shaped by our potter's hand. May we follow our great shepherd. May you do the work in hearts that only you can do. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.